Well, welcome. On behalf of the New America Foundation, my name is Stephen Hill, and I direct the political reform program for the New America Foundation. We're really thrilled about what is going to unfold on this stage this morning because we have some really top-notch quality experts on the issues of voting representation, the, uh, Supreme Court's decisions and voting rights situations, and representation in general in the United States. And we also hope to draw on a lot of you during the question and answer period. I also want to welcome the millions of people who are joining us via live, le le live webcast um, this morning, since we are uh, webcasting this event. Um, the New America Foundation is a nonpartisan policy institute based in Washington, D.C. and California that tries to introduce new ideas and new voices into the political fray. A special thanks to uh, our New America staff here, uh, Troy Schneider, Stephanie Gunter, and their whole crew who have helped really to put on all the logistics for this event. Um, they've done a wonderful job in, in, in work in, in putting this together. So thank you to them for doing the heavy, list, heavy lifting here. We are pleased also, uh, we're pleased here at New America to be partnering with our co-sponsor, FairVote. Uh, FairVote is the leading organization in the United States today advancing electoral methods designed to provide universal representation for all Americans. And it's led by my longtime colleague, Rob Ritchie, who is FairVote's executive director, and he will be moderating the first panel. Besides welcoming you today, I wanted to take a few minutes um, to set today's, events, uh, today's event in a context that um, underpins our deliberations today. The history of voting in the United States has been an epic journey, as I'm sure many of you are aware. In his magisterial history about this, uh, uh, the history of voting in the United States, titled The Right to Vote, The Contested History of Democracy in the United States, political scientist Alex Kizar shows that the struggle to extend the franchise to the poor, to women, and slaves was hard fought with retreats as well as advances. Writes Kizar, some Americans who had been enfranchised in 1800 were barred from the polls by mid-century. Change was neither linear nor uncontested. He tracks the ebbs and flows across the centuries, showing that political elites shifted opinion constantly, sometimes thinking of voting as a right, other times as a privilege that can be revoked or put conditions around. None other, none other than Benjamin Franklin helped us understand the oddity of some of our ancient democratic meanderings that were present at the nation's inception. In one famous Franklinism, he tells a story of a propertyless man who in the 1780s was denied representation because only those who held property were allowed to vote. Then the man buys a mule and he's given the right to vote. So Franklin said to his colleagues, well, let me see if I got this straight. The man has no property, doesn't have the right to vote, but he buys an ass and suddenly he gets the right to vote. I ask you, who is it we are enfranchising? Is it the man or the ass? So many of our current practices today are no less odd when you really stop and think about it. Indeed, much of what we know today as our electoral practices is a product of old attitudes and prejudices where certain special interests had the goal of keeping certain people from exercising their right to vote. Lest we think these attitudes were the exclusive domain of a, of a distant time, let us recall what President Richard Nixon said to John Ehrlichman in the confessional of the Oval Office. Said Nixon, you got to remember, the smartest thing the founders did was to limit the voters in this country. Out of three and a half to four million people, only 200,000 voted. And that was true for a hell of a long time, and the republic would never have survived if all the dummies had voted along with the intelligent people. Now you got people voting now, blacks, whites, Mexicans, and the rest, that shouldn't have anything to say about government, mainly because they don't have the brains to know. This was Richard Nixon uh, speaking so bluntly in the privacy of his office, what, saying out loud what many thought but rarely said. And more recently, we have a very private body, unelected, hardly representative of the nation, but which votes and oftentimes acts like a legislature known as the United States Supreme Court, which has issued rulings that, in my view, have not always seemed to grasp what representation really means. Their rulings hardly ever reflect that representation is not some abstract policy or not some abstract quality, quality but rather is concretely contingent on the ability of any person anywhere, whether it's a black farmer in Mississippi or a Latino single mom in Los Angeles, or a Republican businessman in liberal San Francisco, or a Korean store owner in Miami, or a Rockefeller Republican in increasingly Democratic-dominated New England. 
being able to point to a representative she or he voted for and say, that person, that representative, thinks like me and represents my point of view in the halls of power. They are not just my lesser of two evils choice. They are my authentic representative. And I give them my proxy because that's how representative government is supposed to work. But what is the state of representation in the United States today? Using one kind of measurement, we can see that our nation is, by population, one-third racial and ethnic minority. Yet the United States House of Representatives, is, which we call the People's House, is only 17% minority. The nation is over 50% women, yet the Congress is only 17% women. When you take the snapshot, Congress is still mostly a white guy's club. And I have nothing against white guys. I happen to be one myself. But the fact that it remains that for a country that prides itself on being the paragon of democracy, to have uh, our, 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 our national legislature so badly uh, not look like or think like the snapshot of the country remains a problem. Over 200 years after our nation's founding, after all the marches, all the protests, the court cases, the sweat, blood, and tears, it is still mostly a club that looks so exclusive that if a candidate for Congress were to be a member of a private club that looks like Congress, they would have to resign from that club in order to avoid charges of belonging to an exclusive fraternity. Once Judge Sotomayor, Sotomayor Mayer, joins the Supreme Court, that body, the Supreme Court, will have a higher percentage of women and racial minorities in it, serving in it than the United States Congress. Despite this chronic case of underrepresentation in our national legislature, most recently the Roberts Supreme Court issued an opinion known as Namundo, which we are gathered here today to discuss, that stated rather alarmingly that Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act imposes, quote, substantial fe federalism costs, quote, departs from the fundamental principle of equal sovereignty, and, quote, raises serious constitutional question. Now, we're all glad that the Supreme Court did not simply throw out Section 5 or the Voting Rights Act, but we have to uh, acknowledge that some of, the, um, some of the, 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 the statements made in the court's ruling were rather alarming. Even more significant, perhaps, Namundo was an eight-to-one decision with only Justice, Justice Thomas dissenting, which means that four liberal justices joined in this opinion and adopted its disquieting language that seems aimed at the heart of the Voting Rights Act, which for 40 years has been one of the mightiest pillars on which has rested representative democracy in the United States. How are we to do interpret this latest decision, not only as a standalone interpretation of the law and the Constitution, but as a comment on the nature of representation in the United States in the 21st century? That's what we are gathered here today to discuss. And so having said that and set some of the context for here, let's get started and turn this over to our first panel. Let me introduce uh, Rob Ritchie, Executive Director of FairVote, who's going to kick off the first panel and introduce our esteemed panelists here. Thank you all for being here. I see we're joined by Mr. Hales. Thank you. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing what our panels have to say. It's going to be very interesting. Well, thank you, Stephen, and uh, uh, kicking us off well. And uh, thanks for uh, all of you being here. It's a terrific group. Um, and uh, so I guess I can't lean on this. Um, and I think one um, it, it, important goal of, of the day is to make sure that there's a lot of contributions from the audience. So um, we'll uh, uh, make sure there's plenty of time for that. So I'm Rob Ritchie. Um, Executive Director of Fair Vote. And uh, let me echo Stephen in uh, uh, thanking New America for, for their hosting. Um, a terrific venue. I hope we can do more things with New America here. And also um, to uh, the Fair Vote crew who uh, uh, signed you in and uh, uh, the staff and uh, interns. But we have Adam Fogel, who's our Right to Vote Initiative Director, who's going to be handling the mic during this session uh, when we're doing audience uh, questions. And uh, Amy Nye, who will be in the next panel. Um, and our great crew of summer volunteer interns. So um, it's, it, it, we, we, we uh, often have our, our best performance during the summer, and I think it's because of those folks. We also have a terrific panel here, and I think a very timely, exciting subject. And I think that um, uh, we'll likely have some people here who are intimately familiar with every aspect of the recent Supreme Court ruling on Section 5 of the voting rights case, and we're kind of plunging into the particulars of it, and then some that are still 
learning some of the basics and, and, and then some who are maybe here because they're particularly interested in other aspects of voting rights. And we want to balance um, those topics and both kind of get the basics out there but get into the nuances of what this uh, very important ruling might mean, does mean. Um, and uh, definitely have as a uh, part of this conversation too, what's next? What, what is voting rights in the 21st century all about? What, what, what might this country's voting look like in 50 years, 100 years? And what laws need to be developed to help get us there? Um, and, and, and so it's, we're, we're, we're in the moment. There's a lot of exciting, important things to deal with in the moment. But we're also part of an evolving democracy uh, that the uh, United States has, has, has been on this issue of the right to vote. Um, and that, uh, as, as some of our speakers will address, we actually do not have a clearly established right to vote in the Constitution. And many of the constitutional amendments that we have had in the years uh, uh, since the founding of the country have been about democracy, have been about expanding suffrage. And uh, they often come in waves. And, and, and so we had a wave in, uh, uh, after the Civil War. We had a wave of, of constitutional changes involving suffrage in the 1910s. We had some in the 1960s and, of course, the Voting Rights Act itself. And then at least constitutionally, things have been pretty quiet, but maybe we can have that conversation 50 years later, sort of like every half century. They're sort of like, okay, well, maybe suffrage needs to be redefined and expanded and protected. Um, and then we also have the particulars of the case. And, and, and I'm not going to get into those uh, as a moderator because we have such a great panel. Um, we, uh, uh, I think what I'd like to do with our panelists is, is, is start from what we – learned last week from the Supreme Court what the Voting Rights Act is and, and where it might go short term and then begin to kind of expand the conversation as um, more of our speakers participate. So in that spirit, I wanted to start with Kristen Clark, uh, who is the uh, co-director of the Political Participation Group of the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund, who had a critical role in this case with uh, one of their key attorneys arguing in the oral argument. So. A direct hand in what I think many consider an, sort of an upset win, but an 8-1 win can't be that much of an upset. Um, so um, uh, Kristen is co-director co of the Political Participation Group at the Legal Defense Fund, and she handles a range of voting rights matters, including a constitutional challenge to the, um, to the uh, a voting rights case, the Namundo case. Um, and uh, she received her AB from Harvard and JD from Columbia. Kristen. Like I think you, it, it's up to you. And, 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 and so we're going to keep our opening remarks in the range of kind of five to seven minutes, and then we will be uh, um, having some engagement among the panelists and then bringing you into the conversation. Good morning. Good morning. It's a very good morning indeed. We have Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act in place, what many, many regard to be the most effective and successful federal civil rights law ever passed by Congress. So it is a good morning indeed. And thank you for having me. I want to thank... Um, Rob and the folks at Fair Vote for the invitation to participate in this important event. And what I thought I would do is just maybe lay out some of the context, some of what brought us to the Supreme Court um, in this case, um, some of the events that led up to the congressional reauthorization and then the, the challenge itself that was brought by this small municipal utility district in Austin, Texas. So Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, for those of you who don't know, um, it's a provision of the Voting Rights Act that requires certain states and jurisdictions with very long and entrenched histories of voting discrimination to submit changes that impact voting to the Justice Department or a D.C. District Court for what's called preclearance. And what the Justice Department and the D.C. District Court do is they look at that law to see whether it's one that would discriminate against minority voters um, or one that would worsen the position of minority voters. If they find it problematic, what they do is they object to the voting change and send the jurisdiction back to the drawing board uh, to come up with something else, come up with some other alternative. Um, this law has proven remarkable. And again, it applies in 16 states that are fully or partially covered, many of them deep south states, Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi, Texas, the Carolinas, Florida, parts of California, parts of New York, and elsewhere. But between 1982 and 2006, which were the last periods where Congress revisited whether we still really need this law, there were over 700 um, instances where the Justice Department objected to changes deemed problematic um, or discriminatory 
under Section 5 of the Act. So let me give you some examples. Uh, Louisiana. Every, every single redistricting plan that the state of Louisiana has adopted for its state house has been deemed discriminatory since the act was passed in 1965. Every initial redistricting plan um, that Louisiana has come up with. In their, most last, in their most recent round of redistricting following the 2000, um, uh, release of the 2000 census, they outright eliminated a majority black district in the New Orleans area. Let me give you another example. Uh, Kill Michael, Mississippi. This is a small town. Have any of you heard of it before? <laughs> well, we, got, we got one person in the room. Um, Kill Michael, Mississippi. 2000 census results are revealed indicating a change in demographic in this small town. It had become majority black. Um, it had been governed since the town's inception by an all white uh, town council and by all white mayors. But a number of blacks decided to go ahead and qualify to run for seats on the council and even, even run for that mayoral seat. And what did the all white council do? do? Anyone want to take a guess? Change election day or the, they canceled the election. Oh, said, yeah. We're not going to go forward. <laughs> We're just going to cancel the election and hold over. Um, because this was a change that impacted voting, they had to submit it to the Justice Department that said, no, no, no. Um, we object. And the town went forward, and it resulted in the election of a majority of blacks to council seat and, a major and, and a, the first um, African mayor, African American mayor in this small town in the town's history. So, but for Section 5, we would have had a very different um, result in this small town of Kilmichael, Mississippi. So, those are just some, some examples of the way that Section 5 functions and operates. So in 2006, Congress kind of considers this fact that there are over 700 instances where um, jurisdictions sought, tried, attempted to discriminate against minority voters. Um, they heard evidence from witnesses of all stripes, some of whom are uh, seated at this table and in this room. Um, and at the end of the day, compiled a congressional record that was over 16,000 pages in length. And there was a moment uh, where the um, uh, there was a debate, the debate before the full House on the House floor, and then Chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, Jim, Sensenbre uh, Jim Sensenbrenner, begins to pile the congressional books on top of the table, and they're falling on the floor as a dramatic kind of illustration of how extensive Congress was in its job in compiling this evidence of discrimination that persists in the 16 states that are fully or partially covered by Section 5. And it resulted at the end of the day in a vote that was 390 to 33 in the House and 98 to 0 in the Senate. So you have Congress speaking resoundingly about the overwhelming need and evidence um, that we still really want the protections afforded by Section 5 um, in our country. Six days later, this small utility district in Austin, Texas, the Northwest Austin Municipal Utility District Number 1, files this constitutional challenge um, to Section 5. So six days after President Bush signs the bill into law. And they essentially argued that um, Section 5 is unconstitutional, um, that there wasn't enough evidence before Congress to warrant their uh, extension of Section 5, that Section 5 imposes tremendous federalism costs on those states and jurisdictions that are subject to it, that it uh, imposes a, a scarlet letter on them, kind of presuming their guilt um, before innocence by requiring them to prove that changes they seek to make to voting laws are not uh, discriminatory. Um, we got a very good opinion from a three-judge panel in the D.C. District Court that found the exact opposite, found that there was overwhelming evidence before Congress to justify the reauthorization of Section 5, and then the case proceeded to the Supreme Court. And I want to make sure I leave some space for some of my panelists to, to kind of fill in and tell some of the story. But on April 29th, my colleague Debo Adegbele argued the case, sharing time with the Solicitor General of the United States before the Supreme Court. And it was, um, for those of you who weren't there or haven't had a chance to look at the transcript, I encourage you to do so. Kind of a vigorous exchange between the justices and the attorneys arguing uh, in the case on um, you know, the relevance that race continues to play in our democracy. A uh, real kind of tug, uh, tug of war, I think, between the lawyers who are defending the constitutionality of Section 5 and the justices who, you know, for the most part, appeared very much poised 
uh, to strike the law down. A lot of hostile questions from Justice Kennedy, Justice Roberts, Justice Alito, uh, who all suggested that, you know, though there is some evidence of voting discrimination, uh, that, you know, at the end of the day, they were very concerned about um, the sovereignty of those states that remain subject to seg Section 5, very concerned about the disparate treatment between covered and non-covered jurisdictions. So we've been kind of bracing ourselves for the worst since April 29th, but we're very pleased last week to get, get a ruling where the court left Section 5 intact. What the court essentially did was resolve the issue on a statutory claim that was also brought by the utility district in the case. They argued that um, they were entitled to what's called a bailout. There's a certain provision in the Voting Rights Act that allows jurisdictions that have had a clean bill of health for 10 years to move to terminate their Section 5 coverage status. And the congressional history seems pretty clear that only states and counties and certain jurisdictions that conduct voter registration, uh, but for the most part, that states and counties are the only ones that can bail out, not small little utility districts like the plaintiff in this case. But the court here kind of came up with a different interpretation and reading of the statute, finding this utility indeed eligible to now seek bailout. So now we return back to the DC District Court to see whether indeed they can prove that they um, have maintained a clean bill of health for the last 10 years and can, can now bail out. Uh, but because the court was able to resolve um, the case on that statutory issue, they didn't find a need to reach the constitutional claim, which leaves us in a very good place today of saying that Section 5 remains intact. So I'll end here and kind of pass the baton to uh, my panelists to help fill in some of the gaps in the story, but look forward to taking your questions and answers later. Thank you, Stephen. As you mentioned, by the way, that Stephen and I are former colleagues, and we uh, essentially started our organization together back in 1992, and it's uh, fun to be able to do these kinds of events um, together as we push forward into the 21st century. And I do want to uh, make sure we get back to you, uh, Kristen, about a topic that is going to be a subject that we are definitely going to deal with, which is does Congress have to do more on the Voting Rights Act or not? Um, and, uh, but, 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 but thank you for that overview of the, the need for it. Um, the Voting Rights Act and what happened with the case. Um, so our, our next speaker is Nathaniel Persily, um, who uh, is the uh, Charles Beekman Professor of Law and Political Science at Columbia Law School, um, and just a remarkably prolific, remarkably uh, well-credentialed with his uh, PhDs and uh, JDs, and um, and uh, is is someone who is, has 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 become a, a big player in this field, with I think being cited in the court opinion and um, doing amicus briefs that are quite important to read in in, in 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 these voting cases. And I first met him when he was at the Brennan Center, where um, he uh, also had his uh, uh, his uh, days in the uh, nonprofit world. So, uh, Nate, thank you, and thank you to uh, New America and. Uh, the Center for Voting Democracy for this uh, event. Um, I was in turning back a week to when I saw the decision come down, uh, I was one of those people who certainly thought the Supreme Court was going to strike it down as unconstitutional. I, and this, this decision was for me it, it's sort of like before the oral argument, I sort of felt like a guy who goes to the doctor and assumes he's going to be told he's healthy, then you're told that, you know, they see something on the scan. And that was, it seemed like the oral argument because things looked really bad. And now that we have this opinion, it's sort of like, well, we need more tests, right? Come back later. And so I am at least one of these people who um, uh, is nervous about that decision. Um, and, and while I'm of two minds, and, and you're going to see my schizophrenia uh, today, which is that on the one hand, I think Congress should do something. On the other hand, I'm not so sure they need to, okay? And, and here's the reason. For, first, let, let's be very uh, crass about what um, the situation is at the Supreme Court. Um, 
I think there are, there are clearly, I think there are five votes to strike down the Voting Rights Act as unconstitutional, but there are only five votes to strike it down as unconstitutional. The fate of the Voting Rights Act uh, depends on the health and stamina of those five votes, um, which is not going to last forever. Uh, and the, we can expect, I think, that it's going to take a while for another case to actually go up to the Supreme Court in the correct procedural posture for the court to deal with this central question of the constitutionality of the Voting Rights Act. So I'm going to talk in a second about the four different types of cases that I think will come to the court. Nevertheless, given the, uh, I think the, 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 I don't know if consensus is the right word, but the uh, opportunity that's presented by the current Congress and the administration and let's face it, an election law professor who is actually the president of the United States, um, that we should think more broadly, not just about saving the Voting Rights Act from uh, constitutional defects, but where the Voting Rights Act fits in uh, to progressive change and, and changing democratic rules. So let me start with um, what I think is the good news, and that is that it's going to be difficult for the Supreme Court to get the, the right case in order to strike down uh, the coverage formula of the Voting Rights Act, and here's why. There are, there are basically four ways this case is going to get to the Supreme Court. One is that the court could entertain a challenge similar to the one that it just heard, which is some jurisdiction that's covered by the Voting Rights Act comes in and sues and says, this is an unconstitutional burden. It, it violates federalism values. It violates states' rights. It, um, it, it's unconstitutional for us to have to get federal permission for each one of our changes in uh, our voting guidelines. Um, the response from the Supreme Court, I think after this last decision, is going to be, well, if you are unconstitutionally being covered by this, if this violates your state's rights, or as Justice Kennedy sort of suggested at oral argument, mm -hmm. violates the sort of sovereign dignity of you as a state or locality. Notice how we've come sort of full, full circle. The notion of stigma in Brown versus Board of Education, which was used uh, to, um, in, in, in a way to integrate schools and, and a way to describe the constitutional harm is now being used to talk about the sort of stigmatic harm to states and localities from being co um, covered under the Voting Rights Act. Uh, but so if that case comes to the Supreme Court, the response is going to be, all right, if, you are if you're a good actor, right, well then go and bail out. Just go and do what we just said uh, the Northwest Austin Municipal Utility District can do, okay? And if you're a bad actor, well, then don't come complaining to us. You're constitutionally being covered by the Voting Rights Act. All right? So that's one type of, of lawsuit. The second kind is going to be where a jurisdiction tries to bail out and is denied bailout. Okay? Now, we haven't had that uh, since, we've had, since the 1982 bailout provisions. Um, and the, the possibilities are, you know, if the state of Georgia or Texas or Alabama tries to bail out from the Voting Rights Act, they're going to be denied. Right? It's going to go up to the Supreme Court, and they're going to say, look, it's un these, the bailout is unconstitutionally. It's too burdensome on us. The Supreme Court's probably going to say, well, whatever the, the sort of abstract constitutional questions here, look, the Voting Rights Act can constitutionally cover Georgia and Texas. Right? Have an, if, however, the townships in New Hampshire that are covered under the Voting Rights Act try to bail out, um, first of all, they're going to be granted bailout, bailout but even if they're not, um, then the Supreme Court's simply going to read the bailout statute in order to avoid constitutional difficulty, which is sort of what they just did in the Northwest Austin case. All right. The third context, which is actually the most likely to come to the Supreme Court um, in the next four years, is a challenge to a denial of preclearance under the Voting Rights Act. So for example, say that uh, Alabama changes, it does its redistricting plan, the Department of Justice denies preclearance, and then it goes up to the Supreme Court through the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia, right? This is some, I do expect if these five members of the Supreme Court remain uh, the majority that they are going to uh, either strike down the new standard as unconstitutional or read it in such a way as to save it from constitutional uh, defects. Now, 
again, that doesn't really raise – that's going to be probably the next case, Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act case that goes to the Supreme Court. But it doesn't really raise the issue as to whether it, the, the, a jurisdiction is unconstitutionally covered. And the court, if it finds that the new retrogression standard, the new standard in the Voting Rights Act, it raises constitutional problems, it could even sever that whole part of the Voting Rights Act without touching the actual coverage formula. Okay. Then the last type of case is suppose that the state of Alabama or some um, covered jurisdiction decides not to submit something for preclearance and then uh, Kristen sues them. Uh, and and so they, uh, first of all, you know, you hope that the defendant in a case like that is Alabama because that makes it an easy case. Uh, if it's not, then we, you're back to square one, which is that you just go to the, if it goes up to the Supreme Court, they say, look, either you're a bad actor and you are constitutionally being covered under the Voting Rights Act, or we'll read the statute in such a way as to say the good actors are uh, not constitutional, or that, that, that don't have to be covered under the statute. So this is, I, a lot of this may sound technical to those not in the, the trees and, and looking at it in the forest, but the point is that the Supreme Court last week resolved, interpreted the statute in order to resolve constitutional doubts. Right? And you have, I should note, eight justices right, who, who are now have signed on to opinion which says that there are constitutional doubts with the Voting Rights Act. But it's actually going to become even easier over time for the court to avoid dealing with the constitutional question than it was last week. Okay. Nevertheless, I think it's a good thing to think about changes to the Voting Rights Act, as we always have, uh, in the context of um, regulating American democracy, right? And to think about new problems and new areas of concern. Now, one thing that I think is a relatively costless, well, uh, 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 empirical question of how costly it is, that we should be doing is identifying areas that we all agree should not be covered under the Voting Rights Act, okay? Um, for one reason or another, they haven't chosen to bail out. Right? But it would be useful just to develop a consensus list that no one in this room would object to okay, as to areas that would be um, eligible for bailout. The townships in New Hampshire are clearly true. There are, there are covered jurisdictions that have literally no uh, racial minorities in them according to the census. Right? There are all kinds of jurisdictions who I think we would agree have a spotless voting record and that we should then – uh, use that and, and try affirmatively, you know, law school clinics, other groups, uh, to try and help them bail out from the statute in order to show the court that the bailout option is a real possibility. Okay. The second thing that I think we need to do, and that I think is likely over the medium term, is to develop better measures to assess the state of minority voting rights throughout the country. One of the problems with the current situation is that we really don't know the hot spots in ways that we did historically. Um, and so while it is true that, the covered, that all the examples that Kristen brought up are evidence of uh, why in some of the covered jurisdictions they uh, should remain covered, there are places that are not covered that should be covered. Okay? Um, those of you who are on the ground dealing with voting rights struggles know places like New Mexico, which is not covered under the Voting Rights Act, or St. Louis, are sort of perennial voting rights violators, right? That need to, I, that I think can, you can justify supervision of some of these uh, areas that, uh, in, in ways that uh, you could justify historically the, the areas that are, are currently covered under the Voting Rights Act. So let's get better data. Let's get Congress more involved in finding out things like um, where is it that, that racial minorities are confronting voter ID barriers uh, that, that, uh, in a discriminatory fashion? Where is it that they are waiting online longer than in other places? Where is it that they're facing other kinds of obstacles to voting? We actually don't have good data on that in a systematic way throughout the country. So that, I think, is a, a first step that we can take, even if it's the case that the Supreme Court is not really going to strike down the Voting Rights Act anytime soon. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Nate. Um, we're next going to turn. We're next going to turn to uh, Lisa Bornstein, who uh, I um, am the recipient of her emails often at all hours of day because she is the uh, uh, key contact uh, on voting rights and electoral reform for the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights. She's a senior counsel there and plays obviously a tremendously important role in what happens on the Hill and in uh, shaping and shepherding us all to um, uh, uh, good ends on, on voting rights and electoral reform, and I think that um, she can um, help take us to the next uh, level of conversation here. Thank you, Rob. I'm 
also, I just have to point out, I'm also um, a proud Columbia alum. As yeah, this is quite a mafia We have a little Columbia here, mafia, yeah. yeah, so <laughs> just want to point that out. Um, so thank you, Rob and Fairvote and the New America Foundation for, for putting this panel together. I think um, when we all agreed to be on the panel, we were kind of concerned timing-wise because yesterday was the last day of the Supreme Court uh, term to, to um, hand down opinions and we weren't sure when the decision was going to come down and what we were going to need to do to prepare and respond. So having a week to sort of digest and evaluate, I think it's perfect timing. It worked out very well. Um, we actually coordinated with them. <laughs> Glad someone has an in with them. Um, so, uh, you know, anyone who's read any of the articles or watched any of the coverage about this case, um, which I'll refer to as the MUD case, which is the sort of uh, colloquial name, the, the, the um, abbreviated name, um, heard, has heard some version of the term, you know, we dodged a bullet, a bullet which was dodged, you know, the bullet has been dodged. Um, because the decision uh, eight to one upheld the, the heart of the Voting Rights Act. Um, but as we all know, where there's one bullet, there's often more. So I think we are expecting continued gunfire. Um, what's interesting about this case is the context that it came down in. Um, the Supreme Court has been um, really undermining civil rights protections left and right over the last several months. Um, there was the Bartlett case in March, which by five to four limited section two of the Voting Rights Act. There was the AT&T AT &T versus Hultine case, which um, limited the um, Pregnancy Discrimination Act protections. Um, the Gross case um, limited the um, 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 yeah, the American the oh, excuse me, and I'm blanking on how I'll think of it. Like, in that employment, I, yes, it's it's the Age Discrimination Act, but. Um, I, Sorry, I'm forgetting the acronym. Um, and so, so Gross limited um, the ADEA's interpretation, and in doing so, um, cast sort of doubt on on the way that all uh, non-discrimination um, provisions, other than Title VII, will be in, can be interpreted. Um, and then yesterday, in the Ricci Di Stefano case, um, the Supreme Court, again in a five to four decision, uh, limited uh, Title VII in disparate impact cases. So. Each of those cases really is a, is a major blow to the civil rights statutes that we, you know, that we we have currently to protect us. So, um, you know, each of these cases, the civil the, the justices twisted interpretations and created new standards, ignored precedent. They've just been very extreme in their behavior. Um, uh, in the Gross case, uh, Justice Stevens had this vitriolic dissent saying that this was an unabashed display of judicial lawmaking. Um, he, he talked about um, the majority's inattention to prudential court practices is matched by its utter disregard of our precedent and Congress's intent. Um, similar in, in many ways to, to all of these cases. Um, so while the VRA is left to live another day, um, you know, it's left with a uh, bullseye on its back. Um, there's questions and theories about how this eight, uh, eight-member majority was created and who did what and how what the decisions were based on um, you know but there's language in the decision that the four more liberal justices agreed to which is pretty uh, damning um, you know the VRA is one of the most successful and most important civil rights laws we have um, the amicus briefs there were scores of amicus briefs supporting um, the um, the, the uh, Attorney General and including many of the jurisdictions that are actually covered under Section 5 that are required under Section 5 to, to uh, that are that are required to comply with that, those section that section um, everyone's acknowledged you know the undeniable accomplishments even the court in its decision went through how much the Voting Ra Rights Act has changed things how important it's been how horrible the history of voting rights discrimination was uh, in you know in every measure there's a, a real recognition of the importance of this act and its impact yet at oral argument and in the opinion you know the court basically did everything it could to set it up to potentially be dismantled so the question is do we fix the voting rights act um, I think we need to think long and hard about this I think some of the things we need to do are, I think we need to wait. We need to see um, how the decision plays out, what the impact is, and whether 
there are problems that need to be fixed as a result. I think we prepare. We, um, one of the lessons of the oral argument and the opinion in MUD is that you know, the coverage formula is based on old data. Now, that's important. That is the history that base, that's the basis for this legislation, but we need to continue, as um, Nate said, to build a strong, compelling record, to create a record and prepare for the inevitable next challenge. I think we also need to refocus the debate. We look at the twin elements of both ballot access and redistricting that the court acknowledged are covered under Section 5, um, and we work to shore both of those up. I think the next panel will talk about redistricting after the upcoming census, but the ballot access issue, I think, is really important. Um, voter registration is, is one area that I think that there can be improvements made, and one of the things about voter registration um, um, reform is that that applies across geographic areas, across race. It's neutral in those elements that um, get us away from the court's concerns. We also need to continue to fight new legislative measures like voter ID amendments. We need to work on election administration problems. Um, we need to, you know, attack violations under NVRA. We need to continue to all the fights on all those fronts. And we need to support legislation that improves voter ballot access, whether that's the Democracy Restoration Act, um, allowing um, voting for former felons, um, vote by mail, and other um, uh, options to, in, to shore up the, the right and the access to vote. Um, the House Judiciary, has we've, we've met with the Hill quite a bit to try and figure out where to go and what to do. Um, you know, there's, there may be hearings. One way to handle things is um, having hearings on the various uh, decisions and, and thinking about what makes sense and working that way to build a record. Um, in the Senate side, we are hopeful that there will be some voter registration modernization legislation that comes out that we will work um, to, to support. Um, and lastly, Judge Sotomayor. So what can a wise Latina woman do <laughs> to fix all of this? Um, well, not much, frankly, because these are five to four decisions. You know, she's coming into, at best, the minority of four. Um, and she is a tempered, measured jurist. However, um, uh, perhaps she will join the dissents that have become more vocal as these decisions have become more outrageous. You know, as Justice Stevens noted, there's, uh, in the um, Gross case, there was unnecessary lawmaking. Justice Ginsburg, in the Ricci decision, predicted that the case, the decision will not have staying power. Um, Judge Sotomayor has stated her disdain for wrong-headed decision-making as well. Um, in her dissent in the Hayden versus Pataki case, which is a, a rejection of a voting rights challenge to a New York law denying convicted felons the right to vote, she said, the duty of a judge is to follow the law, not to question its plain terms. I do not believe that Congress wishes us to disregard the plain language of any statute or to invent exceptions to the state statutes it has created. But even if Congress had doubts about the wisdom of subjecting felony disenfranchisement laws to the results tests of Section 2, I trust that Congress would prefer to make any needed changes itself rather than have courts do so for us. Um, I think that, you know, this deference is exactly what was necessary in the Mudd case. Um, I think this, this voice is exactly the kind of voice we need to join the chorus of outrage as these decisions come down that are making um, new law. And I think that, you know, um, hopefully with uh, her, her joining, um, we'll continue to have hope and fight, and someday, as Nate says, we'll have some new blood. Thanks. Thanks so much, Lisa. And um, uh, pleased to uh, uh, introduce our next speaker, which is uh, a former board member of mine and my state senator, so um, <laughs> I can hold him accountable <laughs> to some degree. Um, but uh, I, I, I uh, am very pleased he's my state senator, Damon Raskin, um, who, uh, in addition to being in the state legislature, is uh, director of Washington College of Law, uh, program on law and government, and founder of its Marshall Brennan Constitutional Literacy Project. Um, which is an exciting uh, project, and he wrote a book relating to that called We the Students, and a book relating to this subject, uh, which is um, Overruling Democracy, the Supreme Court versus the American People. Mr. Raskin. Well, thank you very much, Rob. Um, 
delighted to be with my friends from Fair Vote and um, uh, with the New America Foundation. I think Steve Hill, when uh, we started, said that pointed out that we meet um, in a nonpartisan environment. So even though I'm a, a Democratic elected official, I thought I would start by invoking our last great Republican president, Abraham Lincoln, uh, who, <laughs> who spoke of government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Uh, this, of course, was not the way um, we began. We started as a slave republic of Christian white male property owners over the age of 21. And it's only been through waves of political and social struggle and statutory enactment and constitutional changes that we've opened American society up to move from being uh, a closed slave republic to something much, much more closely approximating a democracy. But uh, we're clearly not there yet. Now, the, um, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was uh, paid for by the blood of, uh, of uh, Mickey Schwerner and James Cheney and Andrew Goodman and other martyrs in uh, the civil rights movement in the Deep South. Uh, one of the people who first went down to Mississippi was Bob Moses in 19, 1960. And um, Moses uh, writes in his book, Radical Equations, which I recommend to everybody, that um, you know, he thought he was going to go down and work on trying to integrate public accommodations or schools. Um, and he met a man by the name of Amzie Moore who said, uh, you are standing in a congressional district which is two-thirds black, um, but nobody here has the right to vote because of terror and uh, the Ku Klux Klan and different forms of um, uh, governmental suppression of voting rights. And that was when Moses' Moses's eyes opened to voting rights as a critical issue for transforming democracy, because Amzie Moore and other local activists said, if we can get the right to vote, we can make everything else change. Um, and Moses started to go door to door and actually coined the expression, one person, one vote, knocking on doors, explaining to people the importance of, of registering. Now, the question in, in the wake of, uh, of the mud decision, I, 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 like that, uh, I like that appellation. I'll borrow that if that's okay. Uh, the, the question is, um, do we go back now and try to draft um, a more sturdy, seaworthy preclearance mechanism in statute that will uh, withstand uh, the restless chafing uh, under progressive government by the right-wing judicial activists on the Supreme Court? Or uh, do we not um, necessarily go down that road, or at least go down exclusively that road, but rather try to consolidate and universalize the gains of the modern civil rights movement by writing a robust right-to-vote amendment into the Constitution that will be the basis for all of the legislation that we actually want to enact? Um, now, it's, of course, no guarantee uh, that we'll be able to do what we want to do just by putting language in the Constitution. The history of the 14th Amendment and the Supreme Court's decision in Plessy versus Ferguson proves that. But at least constitutional language creates uh, a kind of beachhead, a rallying point for real social change and possibility. And we're not stuck in the position of just gazing at the court and wondering you know, when Justice Kennedy is going to have his change of heart and whether we can hang on um, through that. Now. Uh, Rob started by pointing out that there have been these waves of, uh, of, uh, of social and political agitation for the right to vote and for democratization in the country, and they seem to come in sort of 50-year surges. They began in the early 1800s with abolition of the property and wealth requirements, uh, returned, of course, in the uh, 1860s with the passage of the Reconstruction Amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, which consolidated the gains of the Civil War and ratified what was going on um, uh, in many of the states which had already extended the suffrage to black people. Um, it comes back again during the progressive period in the early 1900s with the 17th Amendment, for example, which, it, which created direct election of US senators, removing uh, the choice of senators from the state legislatures, uh, most of the states had actually already uh, gone to this system, uh, passing the so-called Oregon Plan, by which the legislature said, we will be bound by the choice of the people, so we'll conduct an election. That was in 1913. Or the 19th Amendment, women's suffrage in 1920, uh, which again ratified what a majority of the states had already done. Um, 
so um, and then and then of course we had the the modern civil rights movement, the so-called uh, second reconstruction in the 1960s, which uh, produced not only the Voting Rights Act, which is the greatest single federal uh, legislative enactment we've ever had, but several constitutional amendments, including the 23rd Amendment, which gives people in this city the right to participate in presidential elections, uh, the 24th Amendment, which uh, consolidated uh, the movement in the states against poll taxes by banning poll taxes in the states for federal elections, and the 26th Amendment, which also followed upon a series of movements in the states to lower the voting age to um, to 18. Now, today, um, I think we need to focus on the fact that the reason we're in this situation recurrently is that we still do not have a provision in our Constitution which affirmatively, positively guarantees everybody the right to vote. What we've got is a sequence of ragtag anti-discrimination amendments that are the product of these social upsurges. But nowhere do we have what, for example, the South African Constitution has in Article I, which most of the new constitutions written over the last 20 or 30 years have, which is a statement that all citizens of South Africa have a constitutional right to vote at every level of government over them and to register to vote and to have their votes counted um, and so on. We don't have anything like that. We've got the 15th Amendment says, well, the states can't discriminate on the basis of race. The 19th Amendment, the states can't discriminate on the basis of sex. But, the, but this anti-discrimination sequence of amendments leaves a lot out. Look what it leaves out today. Um, the issues that are not resolved even if we hang on by a thread to Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. First of all, we've talked about ex-felon voting. Now, again, the vast majority of the states have gotten rid of um, laws that deny the right to vote to people who've done good time and gotten out of prison. But still, in uh, eight or nine states, um, those people are denied the right to vote in perpetuity unless they can get um, a pardon from the governor in some states. Like in, in Florida, if you'd gotten a, a pardon from Governor Jeb Bush, you could have vote and voted in the election between Al Gore and George Bush. Um, but there were 600,000 people disenfranchised as felons. Now, one of the first things I worked on in the Maryland legislature when I got elected, uh, I went to see a colleague of mine now, deceased, the late, great Gwendolyn Britton, and she had been putting in uh, a measure for a decade to try to restore voting rights to felons in Maryland who've done good time and gotten out of jail. And I told her I wanted to work on it, and she said, great, and I sort of forgot about it. And she came to me on the floor one morning, and she said, um, the, uh, the ex-felon voting bill is coming up. Would you like to, to be the floor manager? And I said, uh, well, I would love to. I'm really honored and delighted. And she said, well, don't be that honored. You're the only white senator willing to do it. And I said, well, all right. I'll take it however I can get it. And uh, so the, uh, our friends across the aisle got up and started railing about how the Democrats want to give the right to vote back to murderers and rapists and robbers and arsonists and so on. And so then Gwen turned around and said, okay, it's your turn. You can get up now. And um, so, and, and I said, well, the, the vast majority of people who are going to be reenfranchised under our bill uh, are actually in prison for nonviolent offenses, unlike the people that you've been talking about. Let's take one of my constituents, for example, Jack Abramoff, uh, who's just uh, uh, gone off to, to federal prison in Western Maryland. Uh, for the next six years. Uh, if anybody should be disenfranchised for life, it's somebody whose offenses are against the integrity of our politics and our polity itself. Um, but we do believe in redemption. The purpose of criminal justice is rehabilitation. So we would give the right to vote back even to Jack Abramoff. Uh, and at that point, everybody got up and said they wanted to speak for the Jack Abramoff Voting Rights Act. And, uh, <laughs> and, and we were able to pass it. Um, but uh, it is a seesaw struggle in the states to try to deal with that. If we had a universal constitutional right to vote, uh, we wouldn't have to go through that, despite the fact that the vast majority of states have made it clear where they stand on this issue. People in D.C. continue 600,000 taxpaying, draftable uh, U.S. citizens in the nation's capital are the only citizens of a, of a national capital city on earth who remain disenfranchised in their federal parliament, uh, have no voting representation in the House or the Senate, which acts not only as their federal legislature on issues like the federal budget and war and Supreme Court appointments, but also as their state legislature, ultimately, as we've seen. And the Congress has not hesitated, for example, with respect to gun laws 
to throw its weight around in terms of telling the people of D.C. what their laws should be. Um, we've got millions of people who live in uh, the federal territories, Puerto Rico, Guam, American Samoa, the Virgin Islands, who have no right to vote even in presidential elections, which people in D.C. have. We have weak registration systems. We have states that engage in systematic purges of the right to vote. We've got uh, continuing corporate dominance of elections and so on. So um, I've got one minute to close up here. Um, we've got problems with ballot design, um, uh, the lack of a national ballot, and so on. So I guess the, the point is, is that I think it's time for us to think big here at the New American Foundation. I think the foundation of our new America has got to be universal rights, not being pulled into the trap of fighting over narrow issues of racial symbolism, uh, which is what the right wing loves to do, like in the Ricci case uh, out of New Haven, um, or the majority black and Hispanic districts, which uh, the Wall Street Journal loves to denounce, but to talk about the universal rights that should attach to everybody because of citizenship, and I would hope ultimately they would include the right to, to health care, uh, the right to employment, but certainly the right to vote in the 21st century has got to be fundamental and primary, and it's time for us to write it directly in the Constitution. And from that foundation and basis, we'll be able to write all of the legislation that we want and we need to protect everybody's right to participate. Thank you, Jamie. And uh, uh, our final speaker on the panel is, uh, uh, I mentioned being able to hold Jamie accountable as a voter. Well, Eddie can hold me accountable as a board member of Fair Vote, but he also is a, a senior attorney of the Advancement Project, um, former general counsel of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, has worked as the NAACP, um, and is Reverend Hales on, uh, on Sundays as well. So, uh, Reverend Hales. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much, Rob. It's, uh, it's great to be here with uh, Fair Vote and the New America uh, Foundation. Uh, this is excellent timing, and I'm pleased to be a part of this uh, distinguished panel. Uh, all of my panelists, have, uh, uh, our co-panelists, have made it very easy uh, for me to do my presentation because they've covered a lot of the, uh, the very specific areas that are so critical to this uh, discussion. Uh, Rob, actually... Uh, uh, serve as the general counsel now for Advancement Project, and I point that out now because I see some of my colleagues in the room who uh, serve with our, our voter protection team and the, the director of our redistricting uh, project, Danita Judge, who has done outstanding work in, uh, in uh, the state of Ohio. And I see Tova Wang, who is uh, a great scholar and uh, who's uh, working with us on our Right to Vote project, uh, along with uh, Adam Fogel from Fair Vote and some of our uh, law clerks, both for Advancement Project and uh, for Fair Vote. And it sort of dovetails uh, with uh, Jamie's uh, comments, uh, Senator Raskin, kind of get used to that, <laughs> um, uh, that I want to discuss in a few minutes. But I still, like many of you, um, have uh, Michael Jackson. Um, on my mind and in my heart. And when I think about the, uh, the Mudd decision, it's clear to me the court said, well, uh, perhaps we won't say, uh, never can say goodbye uh, to Section 5, but we will remember the time. And for, in, in the time that, 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 that Jamie pointed out, and it's real clear that there were people who were brutally beaten by axe handles and put in uh, dank and damp uh, prison cells. Uh, people who had their homes uh, firebombed to secure passage of uh, the Voting Rights Act. And it's only been uh, 22 short federal elections uh, since the passage uh, of the Voting Rights Act. And still, it's viable. And I hope that among progressives, uh, we can embrace this attitude that sometimes it's all right to uh, celebrate uh, a victory. Um, you know, there's a lot of nervousness around an eight-to-one decision as if we are unaccustomed uh, to winning. Uh, again, I, I praise the strong uh, legal work of the Legal Defense Fund, uh, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, MALDEF, and other attorneys that actually put forth a very brilliant strategy and marshaled uh, behind that strategy enough facts to sustain an eight-to-one 
decision by the United States uh, Supreme Court. And to the critics of this uh, decision, I just say, as Michael Jackson would say, beat it. <laughs> I'm also reminded, as Professor Priscilla did a great job of talking in, 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 in terms of almost a medical procedure or how doctors would uh, analyze uh, a, a patient. There's a, uh, and I'm telling my age because I didn't grow up in the, uh, the, the, the video game era, but I remember having, uh, Jamie, uh, the operation uh, game board where you had this patient named Sam, and, uh, and he was lying on a, an operating table, and there were 12 cavities uh, on the, uh, on the, in the body, and it had inside uh, uh, maybe a broken heart, uh, a funny bone near the elbow, and uh, butterflies uh, in the stomach. And you had to get a pair of tweezers and go in skillfully and pull out that particular item without touching the metal lining of the cavity, for if the tweezers touched the metal lining, the buzzer would go off, the nose would turn red, and you had to turn the game over to a specialist who could then get double the money. Well, it seems like the Supreme Court decided that we're not in a position to go in and take out the heart of the Voting Rights Act. We just are not prepared to do that. Perhaps Congress is the specialist, but then you want to be very careful and not taking out a heart if you don't have another heart to replace it with. And this is when and why I support uh, Jamie's discussion of a constitutional amendment that clearly, explicitly, affirmatively sets forth a right to vote for all American citizens. And it has to be a very carefully crafted uh, amendment because uh, it is a difficult uh, road uh, to actually uh, set forth, and, in, in it, and it should be done in such a way that actually supports and does not necessarily supplant the Voting Rights Act. Um, in addition to my work with Advancement Project and Fair Vote and uh, in the pulpit, every once in a while, I have some time to watch TV, uh, John, and when I do, I'm a real Nat Geo. I love National Geographic, and I like uh, the Animal Kingdom and Planet Earth, and you see so many examples of, 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 of animals who, rather than building their own homes and their own nests, will find ways of finding existing nets, nests and homes. Bees do it. Warrior bees will find a hive and drive out the current inhabitants and take it over. Well, there are some people that want to stretch the Voting Rights Act so wide that it would weaken it instead of building a movement in support of a constitutional right to vote in the same way that a movement, it took a movement to secure passage of the Voting Rights Act. It took shed blood to secure the, 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 the passage of the Voting Rights Act. And the, there are right now in place enough groups, enough passion, enough tools, technologically, uh, strategic communications, to build a movement in support of a constitutional right to vote bill in a way that will not supplant the Voting Rights Act, but indeed support it. Uh, we now have over 13,000 separate, almost independent voting systems in our nation. There are so many disparate ways in which laws are interpreted, regulations are implemented, and ways in which our systems do and do not protect voters depending on where they live geographically. And we see instances of that throughout our nation, certainly outside of the, the covered jurisdictions under Section 5. But I, I respect, I admire, I, I, I support the efforts of the, uh, the, the groups that, that actually 
push to show Congress that the, uh, the, that the, the Section 5 should be reauthorized. Uh, Lisa, Kristen, a great job in making certain that the record was replete with instances of discrimination in support of uh, reauthorization. There were some groups that actually thought at the time that perhaps a stronger uh, Section 5 should take place. But we respected uh, the wisdom of those who work every day with members of Congress and know the political realities of what it would take to actually uh, pass uh, language depending on uh, past the and, and, and reauthorization of the law with the language that we would want, and we respected the 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 fact that securing a a, a stronger uh, Section Five uh, possibly was not um, going to happen back then, uh, but now the Supreme Court has ruled uh, eight to one, and um, and and John and I will have a uh, five hour discussion. Uh, about the dissenting um, uh, voice on the court, and uh, and and like some of my uh, uh, fellow panelists, I was uh, disappointed uh, that uh, some of the justices did not uh, speak out and speak up about current, ongoing uh, voting discrimination in our nation. Uh, I believe uh, Justice uh, Thomas uh, did say that he acknowledges. That um, that vote, voting discrimination is not a, extent, extinct, and I wish there were more uh, facts put on the record of this decision to make certain that it's clear that an eight to one decision is 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 a very strong indication that Congress need not take any intentional action right now. In fact, and then I, I will close with, with these comments uh, because I do want to hear uh, from some of my colleagues who do more work on the Hill than I do. I don't think Congress has an appetite uh, to respond to mere threats uh, from the Supreme Court. If the, if the court had been more intentional in uh, renouncing uh, Section 5, Congress would have responded. Uh, but with mere uh, dicta, just language that in some ways contradicted the, the holding uh, in the case, uh, I don't expect Congress to put aside its uh, ambitious uh, agenda in dealing with the economy, uh, two wars, health care, and the environment to deal with threats from the Supreme Court. I'll end with that. All right. Thank you. So I, I want to open it up, th this up to the audience. But first, I just wanted to do a quick rapid fire round uh, with each each of you, and maybe you know trying to trying to keep to a minute or briefly beyond. Hard to keep these times straight. But I wanted to throw some questions out, at least just per, uh, sort of provocatively, that you at least could have the opportunity to address, and then anything else that is that you've been thinking about as as you've been listening. But uh, for Senator Raskin, um, one of the proposals we have, and you can see some of our materials out there, but is uh, the idea of a state voting rights act. But as a state senator in a state with, uh, with, a, with a healthy Democratic majority and a Democratic governor, could there be a, some version of a state constitutional amendment that did what you'd like to see nationally and, and or a state voting rights act? Uh, for Reverend Hales um, and Eddie, um, one of the proposals we work on is a national popular vote in the Constitution, uh, a national popular vote plan to establish a national election for president. And this is a statutory change moving in um, states and has passed in enough states, a quarter of the states, a uh, quarter of electoral votes in states that have passed it necessary to enact this compact and have a national popular vote for president govern the next election. If we had such an election, what do you think that might mean for uh, the, the drive for national protections of uh, the right to vote? Uh, for uh, Kristen, um, you know, the, the, the data is so stark in the 1960s, you know, these voter registration disparities of 50 percent or more. Um, and and uh, you know poll taxes and the, you know the, the dramatic need for the Voting Rights Act. You know what what do you think are you know and I think you gave a good example at the start of your talk, but just a few uh, a few things that you think are kind of most dramatic now, and and are there national laws that you're interested in that sort of speak to those in, in addition to the Voting Rights Act, kind of on, on on top of the Voting Rights Act. And and for Nate, one of the questions I I have is. Um, 
about coverage for local elections versus national elections and say if there's a national law affecting voting, uh, that kind of what Rick Pill does once, you know, it, is it going to affect local election practices outside of the covered areas? And I guess secondarily, given all your work on preclearance, do we know enough about the preclearance process now to say that theoretically it actually could be done nationally um, if grounded in, say, a right to vote in the Constitution? Like, is there actually a regime set up where it actually would be practical to have some federal review of all changes to laws and practices to make sure it, it upholds suffrage? And then, Lisa, um, uh, I'd be interested in you know, more of the responses on uh, or sort of commenting on say the idea of a right to vote in the Constitution. That was something that Reverend, uh, that Congressman Jesse Jackson Jr. was proposing with actually the full support of the Black Caucus a few years ago. Um, but also uh, sort of where, where you see uh, the DC vote bill and DC voting rights. So. I'll be careful, man. It's interesting. <clears throat> That's what you get for asking us those hostile yeah. questions. Ah. Uh, you know. <laughs> um, well, um, yes, of, of course, I think that the action can begin in the states. Um, as you know, Rob, one of the first bills I introduced when I got elected to the Senate in Maryland was the National Popular Vote Compact, which passed uh, in Maryland and has now begun to pick up steam around the country. Um, it's passed, I think, in five states now and, you know, maybe more than a dozen legislatures. Um, and I think the same thing can happen with respect to a right to vote constitutional amendment, I think, which would uh, sail through the states. Now, of course, a lot of what we deal with at the state level is very practical, nitty-gritty questions about, um, you know, voting machinery, uh, ballot design, and all of these kinds of things. But I think it would be possible to create kind of an omnibus voters' bill of rights package that would put um, a bunch of these things together. It would not obviate, I think, but underscore the need for a federal constitutional amendment um, guaranteeing the right to vote because of, you know, some of the things I mentioned before about all of the populations that are left out and a lot of states which have just resolved and determined to exclude certain populations from the franchise, the, um, you know, the, the convicted felons who have um, been let out of prison and paid their dues and have had, had every other right restored but not the right to vote is, is a good example when we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people across the country. National uh, popular vote uh, proposals uh, certainly increase the uh, opportunity for uh, more people to be excited about elections, um, having the, uh, the strong belief that uh, if they vote, in fact, their, their vote will uh, count towards the, uh, the election of, uh, of, of a president, and it won't depend, again, on uh, where they live uh, geographically and, and uh, whether they are are in the uh, so-called uh, battle state or whether they're in a, a jurisdiction that is, uh, is, is, is overlooked by uh, candidates. So driving up participation by building voter confidence that their vote will make a difference is, is very good. Uh, it, it doesn't, in, in, in my view, uh, take away the need to support a, uh, a, a constitutional uh, amendment uh, uh, that explicitly, affirmatively sets forth a right to vote because you have other uh, forms of discrimination that will still get in the way. But it certainly is a, is, is, is a way to uh, support the general principle of a right to vote, and that is to increase participation by all uh, eligible Americans. Thanks for that question. I, um, I just wanted to make sure I clarified one thing, and that is that when we talk about Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, we're talking about a kind of voting discrimination that's very unique and peculiar to the places where Section 5 of the Act applies. So when we talk about some of the present-day problems that we're dealing with, like long lines at the polls in St. Louis and felon disenfranchisement statutes, that's really kind of a different animal. And I'm glad that we do have other federal voting rights laws to deal with those kinds of issues that we're talking about, new laws that might uh, be adopted by Congress to deal with those new issues. But Section 5 really was adopted by Congress in 1965 and has been subsequently reauthorized for dealing with the, the just unique problem of, of states that have long resorted to deception and trickery um, to deny minority voters access to, to the ballot. So. Um, so when I hear concern, you know, um, suggestions about Section 5 kind of expanding to other states or um, being expanded to deal with new kinds of problems, it makes me very nervous. 
Um, Section 5 does impose some federalism costs, but the Supreme Court has recognized on two prior occasions in City of Rome and in uh, South Carolina versus Kot Kotzenbach that those federalism costs are just, are, excuse me, I'm trying to jam this all into a minute. <laughs> oh, you have another 45 seconds. <laughs> uh, that those federalism costs are justified based on the kind of unique and peculiar histories of um, voting discrimination that you find in the Deep South states and in the other states that are subject to Section 5. So um, let me just point out one thing, some language from Board of Trustees of the University of Alabama versus Garrett. This is where the Supreme Court recognizes it's, that Section 5 is a detailed but limited remedial scheme, limited. Um, there's some other, se other features about Section 5 that the Supreme Court has often kind of pointed to, touted that um, are what um, I think has, has brought us to the point where just last week, Monday, the court was unwilling to strike it down as unconstitutional. It's temporary. Congress has to revisit the need periodically uh, of, of whether we truly need Section 5's protections in the covered states. It's not national. It, you know, Congress tried to devise a coverage formula that reasonably captured those places that have uh, very long and entrenched histories of discrimination. It's not static. There's this kind of bailout feature that I talked about earlier where jurisdictions that have a clean bill of health can move to terminate their Section 5 covered status. And it doesn't apply to all laws. It only applies to laws that touch voting. So all of those features, I think, are really kind of crucial and are reasons why the Supreme Court was unwilling to strike it down as unconstitutional. And so I think we should be very careful about these kind of proposals uh, uh, proposals and efforts that suggest that expanding the scope of Section 5 to new areas, to new problems, um, is, a, is a good thing. I think it's a bad thing. It's a poison pill, and it's the kind of thing that would inevitably lead this court to strike Section 5 down. All right, since I'm making Kristen nervous, let me uh, try and justify it. Um, so, so the gather. First of all, I, I don't think anyone's in uh, uh, opposes the idea of gathering data, right, on on trying to figure out where the hot spots for um, uh, problems with American democracy are, and particularly for minority voting. Um, I think that there are actually, in some jurisdictions, um, we do have kind of classic deceptive practices outside of the, the covered jurisdictions. And obviously, some place, I mean, no one disagrees that some parts of the covered jurisdictions are uh, uh, less bad actors than, than some parts of the, of the non covered jurisdictions, right? The Arkansas should be covered by the Voting Rights Act. The fact that it wasn't is a political decision from the 1960s. Uh, all that being said, the, 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 uh, Kristen's point about well, what what is most likely to be constitutional or not is, I think, the right question, and I'm I'm not so sure I have the answer. Does expanding the Voting Rights Act with new data make it more or less constitutional? The Supreme Court seemed to suggest yesterday or last week that it would make it more constitutional to to bring in new data, and the data on lines and voter ID discrimination and that type of stuff is not just to deal with those problems; it's also to justify what parts of the country are covered and what you're not. Uh, and so I think that, and I actually am pretty confident that once we get that data, it will actually bolster the current Voting Rights Act in a, in a way that uh, the data in the in the current record doesn't. Um, but 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 we'll we'll see. Now this goes to Rob's question, which is to what extent should we? Be thinking about this as, um, which, first of all, should this be done nationally as opposed to um, state by, the, the, you know, partially? And and Kristen's right, which is that the, you know, the pre the selective targeting of jurisdictions has always been one of the things that has made the Voting Rights Act more constitutional, not less. Yeah. This case has raised the specter of the possibility that has made it more less constitutional, right? Because the Supreme Court is now almost looking at this in the terms of kind of equal protection clause for states, uh, so that you know that, that you're discriminating um, uh, you know, against Alabama and in favor of Ohio. Now, I don't know. We will see whether they will visit, I, I mean, I think at some point they are going to visit that question. Making it national, sure, we could, if you quadruple the size of the voting division at Justice Department, you could make it national. Um, the question, I think most people feel that that 
you know, that that, that that exacerbated the federalism costs, right, that, that uh, had been part of the discussion of the Voting Rights Act for the last 40 years. So that was not really on the table. If anything, during the reauthorization process, we all thought, well, that would be more likely to be held unconstitutional, not less. But let me, just to get to you, the first part of your question, which is, where where is the Voting Rights Act really making the most difference? And I have always been a believer that it makes the most difference in areas where it is least transparent and where, and in particular, at the local level, right? It is where cha it is in, in decisions in, in the local jurisdiction, which is deciding to move a polling place or deciding to annex territory, which we simply would not know about but for the fact that they have to have DOJ in the room with them right, in uh, the decision as to whether to pass this law or not. And so as you actually go up the, the geographic chain, it actually, the VRA, I think, does less. It's really in those less transparent local decisions where the VRA continues to have its uh, biggest bite. First, let me just say Age Discrimination and Employment Act. <laughs> That's what ADEA stands for, and I, I apologize for the brain freeze. <laughs> I thought of it in the middle of Senator Raskin's speech and almost interrupted, but I can <laughs> um, So in terms of the idea of a, of a right, uh, a constitutional right to vote, I think it's very interesting, you know, theoretical idea. Um, and I think the reality is um, pretty daunting. And so the question is whether that's where you want to put your resources. I, I, I agree with Reverend Hales that there are a lot of ways to increase participation based on existing statutes and existing constitutional um, amendments um, and, um, and other laws that, that can u be used to really increase the vote. And I think that um, in this political situation, in this political reality, I think that may be a safer way to go. Um, just for example, the D.C. vote bill, which um, Rob asked about. Um, so my the leadership conference is a coalition of over 200 civil and human rights groups, um, and what we how we work is in coalition. So we, in fact, Kristen is, is the co-chair, along with John Greenbaum, who's on the next panel, of the Voting Rights Task Force, which is, you know, our, uh, the, the way that we um, move forward with our voting rights work. Um, and I think... Uh, so, so the DC vote, voting rights is um, is a separate um, group of folks that that are working on this issue. And the leadership conference is involved in that. I'm not actually working on that issue, so I'm going to tell you a little bit of a water cooler conversation because that that's how I know it. Um, but but basically, um, so the DC uh, voting rights bill is something that seems uh, that it should be pretty non-controversial. And you think about the fact that um, you know th that we, that hasn't been able to get passed. And right now, I mean, the, the issue that has stalled it right now is that um, in the Heller decision from the Supreme Court, um, now a lot of the conservative um, Republicans want to add um, a gun amendment onto the uh, D.C. voting rights bill, and that has really been a non-starter for a lot of the f supporters of the D.C. voting rights. So it's really jammed it up. And I think even just the uh, the little DC voting rights bill can't get a lot of traction because of the political realities. And so I think that the idea of a, a constitutional right um, would, would probably create a lot of additional uh, complications. Um, and just frankly, the political realities right now are that, um, you know, any bill that the civil rights community is trying to get passed is real, or, or any of the nominations, even Tom Perez, the civil rights division nominee for head, um, for head of the civil rights division, you know, he, he can't even get through even though he has a huge support from all uh, sides. Um, the problem is we have, you know, big liberal champions who are out who are not, uh, not uh, who are sick and not there right now. We have Al Franken still sitting in Minnesota. Um, you know, we have all kinds of difficulties that make every move difficult, even in a situation where we have uh, President Obama and we have a, a large majority in the Senate and the House. So, um, you know, I guess I'm just a realist, sadly. You know, so so that's my my thoughts. One, one comment from Eddie Hales before we open yeah, it up to Donnie. I, I, and I said this, uh, this before, I, we're, we're, we're in this, this period where we should be celebrating and rejoicing. We just got this great decision. We have an African-American uh, president, seven presidents after the, the Voting Rights Act, with he's the 44th president, 44 years after uh, the, uh, the, the Voting Rights Act uh, was, was passed. 
and you 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 have a president who had the vision, the the, the big vision to think big, to 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 recognize that people are sad and sort of thinking that you can't really get things done unless there's a light that in, inspires them. There's some paradigm of, of passion, something that ties together all of the separate movements. Uh, the the uh, D.C. Uh, residents are very excited about uh, getting, the, uh, get, get, getting voting rights. But people in Colorado may not be concerned about that, but they have database matching problems uh, in, in Colorado, and they can be uh, united uh, with people who are people with felony convictions, and, and their families may not be connected to some other disenfranchised community communities. But if you link everybody together and say there's this one driving force towards increasing participation for all eligible Americans under this uh, uh, umbrella of an explicit affirmative right to vote, and in the same way that people doubted that we would see a, uh, an African American uh, sit in the White House in our lifetime, uh, the same people that are, are putting together um, um, barbecues and, and making videos and, and tweeting each other and going on face book and, and, and really coming up with the kind of tools we have available to us today to excite people. People are just too sad in a time when we should be rejoicing about new opportunities for participation. <laughs> All right. On that Amen. note, thank you, Eddie, and thanks to the panel. Um, let's uh, let's hear, hear from some, some uh, of our many thoughtful people in the audience. Is there a question there? Good morning. My name is Stan Boyd, and I work with Save Our Votes in Maryland, which is concerned with the second part of Jamie, uh, Senator Raskin's uh, proposal that not only uh, all citizens have the right to vote, but that the votes be counted as the people actually cast them. And uh, I am concerned because, or Save Our Votes is concerned because, uh, first of all, uh, the computer experts, uh, people who teach in the universities, uh, computers, uh, say that it is extremely easy for uh, software to be programmed to alter votes and that it can be done in such a way that uh, it cannot be detected. And uh, Jesse Jackson, Jr., himself said that the paperless voting machines that are used in many states today are the new uh, Jim Crow of the 21st century, and we have to do something about that. And uh, in addition, they have found that in some states, such as Florida, Georgia, Ohio, and New Mexico, the machine count was at least 5% different towards Republicans in most of those states than the paper count. Where, well, where they had paper, they found the 5% difference, but where they didn't have paper, there was a 5% and more difference uh, slanted to the Republicans than what the exit polls showed. Hey, Stan, so here's we, my we're, question. We're short on time. Yeah, yeah, so good. I got Thank two you. questions here. First, uh, since this is a real issue, is the New America Foundation and the various people on the panel here, are they, uh, they going to take this on and uh, really put support behind the Holt Amendment, which would require paper ballots in all states, and which is up uh, for uh, legislation and uh, hopefully also get states to do follow through. And the second question, until we can be sure that our votes are being actually counted the way they are cast, is it really wise to get this compact to say that uh, all states will go with whatever the popular vote shows if that means mostly blue states are signing on and then they're going to cast all their votes for the Republican if a majority of votes get uh, altered in an election so that the Republican candidate gets the majority of the vote when really he, he didn't get it from the people. Senator Raskin, you want to okay. handle that one? Um, well, there's a lot there. Thank you, Stan Boyd, for the, your wonderful questions. First of all, I, obviously I can't speak for the New, New America Foundation. You know that I've been deeply involved in Maryland in making certain that – uh, that we have paper record for our ballots. I mean, the struggle in Iran today, uh, everybody had the right to vote, 
the question is, were the votes counted? So there, there are two sides to the equation, and you're absolutely right. And if we do a constitutional amendment, we've got to make sure that we, uh, we address that. Um, on the national popular vote, I guess I just see it differently. I think that we're much more vulnerable today to electoral mischief and corruption um, if uh, all the electoral college votes from one state can be stolen. Florida 2000 is a great example where – millions of votes cast, uh, the victor ended up with 537 more votes than the loser. Um, and all 25 of Florida's Electoral College votes suddenly went into the Republican column, and the rest is history, including Iraq and Afghanistan and everything else. Um, I think that we're much better off with the National Popular Vote Plan, which says that the states will be bound by the winner of the national election, which in the 2000 case was Vice President Gore. Um, and you're right that it does mean that we're all linked together more dramatically. Um, but in fact, we're already linked to the character of the voting process in Florida or Ohio. Um, and I think that one of the, the beneficial side effects of the National Popular Vote Plan is it will force us to focus on the fact that we should have a national ballot for president that looks the same in Alaska, in New York, in Texas, in Alabama. Um, and we should have voting systems that work, that uniform, that work across the country. And when you poll this, incidentally, vast majorities of the people favor a national uh, popular vote for president, where the, the person who gets the majority wins or the plurality wins. Um, everybody favors a right to vote. Most people think that we have a constitutional right to vote, but, uh, vote, but everybody favors putting it in. And everybody um, overwhelmingly favors uh, a uniform ballot. So I think the national popular vote plan it moves us in the direction of national uniform standards. Um, I'm Marcia Johnson Blanco. I'm a voting attorney at the Lawyers Committee. And this question is primarily for Professor Persley and Kristen. Um, in light of your concerns and about the, um, the Supreme Court's concerns about the um, constitutionality of the Voting Rights Act, the fact that some states are not covered that should be covered, um, what, do you, what are your thoughts about using 3C, the bail-in provision, and what would be the challenges with using that? That, I, I'm the, just to update people on, on this, and I'll, I'll answer real quickly. Um, there's another option under the Voting Rights Act to bail in certain jurisdictions, but you, th that is extremely expensive and very sort of resource intensive and probably would not reach many of the jurisdictions that we would all agree, if, if, if we could agree, uh, that, that might want to be covered, uh, that we that we think should be covered. So, I mean, we've only had, I think, two since 1982, I could be wrong on that, um, that have been able to be bailed in to the Voting Rights Act. Um, I tend to think that that uh, it probably, um, we, we, it, it should be, a, I think, a remedy that is used more often, but it really hasn't been, and, and um, uh, probably I'd, I'd look for other kind of legislative solutions first. Yeah, I think that um, both bailout and bail-in kind of raise interesting issues. There, there are some provisions of the Act that many people just don't know that much about. And um, I'm hopeful that we'll see the Justice Department, I know there's some folks from DOJ here today, doing more to, you know, conduct outreach to jurisdictions that might be eligible to bail out to do so, kind of walk them through the requirements that they would need to satisfy to uh, go ahead and file a successful bailout petition with the D.C. District Court. And, and likewise, I think, you know, bail-in, we've seen it work in Arkansas. And both the bailout and bail-in provisions illustrate that Congress kind of did a good job in constructing an act that's not static, that, you know, focuses on 16 states that met certain criteria when the act was passed in 65 and or, and or reauthorized subsequently. Um, you know, states that have very long and entrenched histories of serious discrimination against minority voters for the most part. But the bailout and bail-in provisions are a way for this list of states to kind of contract and expand in a way that's reasonable. Um, so, so I think, you know, in combination with more outreach on part of DOJ to reach, reach out to jurisdictions that have clean, clean bill of health, a clean bill of health, um, that this will be a kind of helpful fact if we are ever before the Supreme Court again faced, uh, you know, faced with another constitutional challenge where we can present to the court kind of evidence of many jurisdictions that uh, may, may um, 
uh, that perhaps should not be subject to Section 5 being able to successfully do, do so through bailout petitions before the D.C. District Court. I think it's a good thing. Uh, Rob, before the next question, I just want how many people in the room here are actively involved in voting rights either as attorneys, as professors who teach the subject, I just want to get a, or any other capacity, let's get a show of hands, <laughs> quite a few people. So all of you have a lot of opinions and questions and that's what we want to try to get in here as many as we can to promote a conversation. So don't be shy, get your hands up. Okay. And, 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 and so maybe we can just have like uh, three questions, three, three short questions from, and, 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 and then uh, get some final comments. So for those, um, so Adam, you want to, we have a microphone? Yeah, we have Alan Morris at George Washington Law School. Uh, Nate, uh, you're, you suggested that perhaps the local effects of the Voting Rights Act are more significant. Would you propose decoupling the redistricting from the local registration requirements? Uh, because that's the import of the question. And of course, uh, well, I, I, I'll leave it to you to explain what the ramifications of that might be. And Adam, there was uh, uh, John Britton here. I'm John Britton, a professor of law and former chief counsel for the Lawyers Committee. One point that hasn't been mentioned in this discussion is the nature of the uh, political ideology in this battle. The same lawyer who led the case in the mud, Greg Coleman, also led the case in Ritchie. And politically, the right wing has selected the Supreme Court in this battle for racial and ethnic equity and civil rights. My question is, should we be more political in attacking the right-wing opponents in public and mobilizing against them? And if so, what do you think is the most effective strategy? And any uh, third question that we want to... Uh, Steve Pershing, GW Law School and ex-Justice Department. It's so wonderful. This is like a whole home we can hear. It's fabulous. Uh, I'm going to ask something that may be impertinent. Now that we have seen what the Supreme Court does, now that we know the court is as hostile as we feared, where are we on updating the statute? What's the state of the conversation? I've heard people say we've put it off. That's apparently different from what we had before, which is we don't want to touch the statute. We understand why we didn't want to touch it. Now we understand why we want to put it off. We may never see another challenge, as Nate has pointed out. But I'm interested to know from you all what the state of the conversation is. Is there rumbling? Is there murmuring? Or are we trying to suppress it? And here's my suggestion that we go through one more time, just, just uh, uh, answering these questions. Then we've had a very patient audience. Um, we can uh, take a break, talk with one another, and then move into the next panel. So let's just hear, hear from each panelist uh, on um, any comments, last comments you have. Um. Well, in terms of the, the last question, the state of the conversation on the status, um, I think, you know, it's a week. It's been a week. Give us some time. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think that s the voting rights um, activists and, and um, advocates that I work with, I think we're all very cautious and likely to feel that, you know, um, not acting, as I said, waiting and observing what's going on makes sense at the moment. Um, and just quickly in terms of, of John's question, I think um, I think we have the higher moral ground by, do, you know, defending things and um, responding to things in an honest and legal way rather than trying to drum up some fabricated um, basis on which to attack things. So I don't think we should change our, our tactics. So for, for Alan's question, I do actually think that we've become too focused on redistricting as the locus for all of, uh, and this court has uh, become too focused on, on the Voting Rights Act as being about redistricting. Uh, I think that the, with respect to minority participation, that actually redistricting is not the main arena for challenge, but other more classic barriers to enfranchisement. Um, and I think that also because for various other political reasons, I, I, I think that uh, redistricting, there are reasons to think that um, 
other statutes and uh, current incumbents are going to be able to defend themselves in the statewide redistricting process in a way that uh, haven't historically. Nevertheless, that's not going to change, and I, you know, I don't think that that's worth um, fighting about. And and I've been very active, obviously, in, in statewide redistricting stuff as well. But 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 this is by way of emphasizing the local jurisdictions. Most of the denials of preclearance and the voting problems that make it up, made up the record in um, for the, legis the reauthorization occurred at the local level, um, and especially the most horrid examples of discrimination. Uh, and so, and we should keep that in mind in, in, in the enforcement of the Voting Rights Act. And this is mainly an empirical point. I mean, I think some people feel that actually redistricting is where we should be most uh, involved and that some of the other things like polling place moving and other uh, changes shouldn't be the focus. I, I, don't, I don't see this as a big controversy. With respect to the where's the state of play on updating the statute. All right, so here, here are the three schools of thought one week out, right? One is uh, trembling nervousness, change it immediately. The other is do nothing. And then there's the middle ground, of course, you know, to make myself look diplomatic, I'll say I'm in the middle ground, which is that uh, I, I'm, I'm right now, I don't think there's any rush, as I was saying before, for, for those reasons. I think that um, in some ways you should think of this as, as a, a twofer. Let's use this, this time period um, after Namudno in order to gather information, right? Gather information that both could justify the current Voting Rights Act and inform us about other problems that really need solving. So we need uh, basic tools that, that Congress can provide, and I've written about this elsewhere, to evaluate the quality of democracy throughout the 50 states. The fact that we don't actually even know how many people voted in the last election is a problem, okay? And, and um, uh, the estimates are off by millions. Let me say two other things. First of all, I, I do, this is, uh, let me, let me um, at my peril, disagree that this is a victory. Uh, the eight to one decision is uh, if you told us six months ago that this is what this was going to look like, no one would have called it a victory. It's only a victory because we thought that uh, they were going to push the VRA over the cliff. The fact that it, it, it narrowly averted that uh, is not, it, it, I mean, it, it, a, you know, a sigh of relief is appropriate, uh, it's, but, it, but it's not um, as if we, we've avoided uh, possible challenges down the road. And like I said, the fact that the liberals are willing to sign on to an opinion which raised constitutional doubts about the central questions of the Voting Rights Act should uh, raise some red flags. Now, let me be more ha glasses half full. This is the first time since the Voting Rights Act was passed that we will have a Democratic president enforcing it. Um, we had Richard Nixon's DOJ doing the 1972, uh, and I, I, when I, let me be specific, after, during a redistricting cycle. Uh, so 1972, you had the Nixon Justice Department. 1982, you had the Reagan Justice Department. 92, you had George Bush, the first Justice Department. 2002, you had um, George uh, a, a, uh, George W. Bush's uh, Justice Department. Now, of course, for the Justice Department lawyers, I don't mean to suggest that it's always depending on the uh, president who is involved, uh, but the, it makes a difference. And I suspect that with this election law professor in in charge, uh, and we know a lot of the people who are going to be involved, that that. Um, something, some things might be different this time, and that they might be more aggressive, uh, both in the redistricting process and in um, other w other election-related changes that some of the covered jurisdictions are going to make. Let me um, first start off by providing a brief response to Steve's question. I think that you know, the the feeling I think among the civil rights community, and I can't at all speak for everybody, is that we have to be very deliberative in our approach to whether or not we want to reopen Section 5 before this Congress. I think it was Representative Norwood who this past Sunday wrote an editorial in the Washington Post calling for reconsideration of amendments, hostile amendments, frankly, that he had introduced during the reauthorization. We know that um, if we reopen Section 5, we're going to see attacks on the minority language provisions, attacks on Section 203, people again calling for English-only elections. Um, so there could be lots of cost uh, that outweigh any benefit, I think, that we might receive through just reopening um, the gates, reopening the floodgates. Um, so, so I think caution and proceeding deliberative, deliberatively is very critical at this time. Um, and then back to the earlier question, 
You know, I think we see Section 5 working on both the local level all the way up to the state level. If you recall, I brought up two examples of stark discrimination considered by Congress during the reauthorization. The Kill Michael, Mississippi, small little town, local level. And then state redistricting plans that have been um, uh, infected with discrimination adopted by the state of Louisiana. The state of Texas, same thing. Um, the state of Texas engaged in a mid-decade redistricting that was before the Supreme Court in a case called LULAC versus Perry, where Justice Kennedy used language describing that plan as uh, bearing the mark of intentional discrimination that almost rose to the level of an equal protection violation in his eyes. So we see the discrimination today from the local level all the way up to the state level. So this idea of kind of, uh, you know, once again, reopening Section 5 and maybe focusing just on the local level, taking out redistricting, I think goes against the weight of evidence, which shows that we just see discrimination, uh, frankly, rampant from local to the top, from left to right. Um, we need it to deal with discriminatory polling place changes. We see jurisdictions um, moving polling places to remote locations, hostile, loca um, hostile locations. We see um, redistricting plans that knock out majority minority districts. We really need Section 5's full um, protections to ensure that our democracy ma remains a vigorous one. And frankly, we probably wouldn't be in the place where we are today, which is with an African-American president in place, but for Section 5 working to knock out the more than 700 instances of discrimination that jurisdictions would have adopted in the covered jurisdictions but for Section 5's protection. So African-American president, and that's uh, attributable in large part to the benefits and protections provided by Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. I'm going to go back to my victory talk. I'm going to celebrate <laughs> only because um, if you've been waiting to exhale and you finally have an opportunity to exhale, you don't call it a, a loss. Um, and I'm aware. I've, 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 I've seen the blogs. Uh, um, they're, they're, they're very interesting. They're, um, um, they, they, they give me pause to think. And when I do, I recognize there's uh, a lot of work to do to in, in, increase the uh, – strategic uh, communications campaign on the ground. Uh, John, when you mentioned sort of how do you confront the, the right-wingers publicly, um, there is a message that will resonate uh, among people on the ground who are fundamentally concerned about opportunities to participate in our democracy. And I believe in using that operation uh, illustration I did uh, before, if the Supreme Court had attempted to carve out the heart and it touched that metal lining and it caused a big buzz, our nation would be in a lot of uh, trouble. And I think that was uh, something that the, the court considered. There's a, uh, um, there, there, there's a special uh, meaning in communities that historically have been uh, disenfranchised uh, about the right to vote. Many of you um, uh, recall that it, it was an email uh, message that went out, uh, Gilda, in, in the, uh, the 90s, and it keeps resurrecting, um, saying that the, um, the, the Voting Rights Act is about to expire when there was a conversation around reauthorization. And you talk about mobilizing people, that was a huge effort to say we're going to do everything we can to protect our Voting Rights Act. We want the right to vote. And I think we're at a, a point uh, in, 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 in our nation's uh, history. Again, 22 short federal elections uh, since the passage of the Voting Rights Act uh, where people want to have that assurance uh, that it's not going away. And there are these uh, uh, new, um, subtle, sophisticated, disenfranchising schemes that need to be addressed, and we just uh, have the, 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 the confidence that there's a whole new generation of voting rights um, litigators and advocates, uh, and, and people can communicate about these uh, issues that will make certain that it's, it, it's protected no matter what happens um, uh, in the Supreme Court. I think it's, a, it's too much to speculate what the next uh, uh, case will be. But I, I just have that confidence that this new generation uh, of advocates will be prepared to do what uh, LDF and others did 
uh, in this uh, MUD case. I also just want to respond quickly to Professor Britton's point, which I think is um, exactly what we need to be thinking about. Uh, to my mind, the assault on the Voting Rights Act began in 1993 with the Supreme Court's decision in Shaw versus Reno, which is one of the most um, outrageous outbursts of right-wing judicial activism in American history. It's a decision that's completely unprincipled, um, unrooted in the text of the Constitution, the history of the Equal Protection Clause, any precedent that went before it. And it, it really picked up on a couple of Wall Street Journal editorials with some uh, pictures of congressional districts. Um, and the whole theory is, is that, you know, a bizarrely drawn majority black or Hispanic district it violates equal protection, but a bizarrely drawn majority white congressional district, i.e. all of them, don't violate equal protection. I mean, when did anybody ever think that a congressional district had to be a perfect square or circle or triangle or some recognizable geometric shape? But it became the pretext for trying to roll back the gains uh, that were made under the Voting Rights Act. And um, so I, I think that uh, certainly those of us in academia have an obligation to continue to expose the utter um, charade uh, and fiction of Shaw versus Reno and Miller versus Johnson, which are a complete assault on the idea of the rule of law and perpetuate a racial double standard uh, in, the, in the guise of equal protection jurisprudence. Having said that, um, at the same time, I think that we have to knock down that theory. Um, progressives do need to be far more visionary and experimental um, in promoting other voting systems and moving away from single-member districts, which are not necessarily the best way. Single-member territorial districts are not necessarily the best way to promote all the values of democracy, including full inclusion and diversity um, and having everybody heard. And a lot of courts, actually, in Voting Rights Act litigation have begun to recognize this and have used as remedies different forms of proportional representation, including cumulative voting and limited voting. I think there was a decision Rob pointed out to me just yesterday like this. And so I think that we, you know, the next generation of voting rights struggles are going to be to open up the, the, the creaky, ancient, uh, atavistic technologies that we've got and voting systems that we've got to the great wide world of democracy, which has continued to advance and progress everywhere else on earth, and there's a lot to learn from what other people have done. All right. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm going to send you all out with just my, my vision of what I think is going to happen in the next 10 years. It was a little less than 10, 10 years ago that uh, we had the 2000 presidential election, Shaw, uh, Bush, 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 Bush v. Gore, and all the controversies of that year. I think 10 years from now, when it's 2020, we will have the national popular vote plan for president and all votes counting equally for presidential elections across the country and that with that will have come some really blowing up of, 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 of the way we think about some basic um, issues of election administration, the voter registration modernization movement, um, and, and moving toward universal voter registration. We'll, we'll, we'll see some progress toward that, but I think really triggered more and more when we think about the fact of every vote counting equally, the, the, the whole voting equipment uh, process and regime and the, the broken certification process, but the very fact that we turn over our vote counting process to private vendors with very little accountability or, 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 or a very poor construct of that. I think that's going to be uh, blown up. And I think that uh, this issue of the democracy index and the sort of review of practices at a local level, that I think the preclearance mechanism provides a model for how it could be done just in, in looking at elections and its impact on participation, that that could be something that could be grounded in a constitutional right to vote. And it all sort of fits as a unit. Um, and, and, and certainly the last part of it for us, which is going to be more to, uh, an issue in the next panel, but is, is issues of representation and changing voting methods and accommodating the great diversity of thought and people that we have in this country. And I think it's going to be an exciting decade. So thanks so much for, uh, for our panelists. We'll reconvene in 15 minutes for sure. We've got a second panel that's excellent. Thank you. So much.